Alright, hey guys, um, so a couple things I want to talk about today, uh, some being, you know, the uh, GT foot pad, I'm not going to dive into any of the issues and politics surrounding the GT, and uh, foot pads that I recommend, and then kind of what to do in case your board does ghost. And then one of the things I'm going to kind of dive into at the end is also what potential modifications you may want to make for a GT foot pad uh, sensor. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna work, but it may make your sensor worse. It may actually fix something, I don't know. Um, so all that said, I've ridden my board a bit with the Craft & Ride uh, foot pad, the air pad on the front and kind of compared it back to back, also with the various cushions. Overall, in my opinion, I do not believe that the AirPad is a great or even good foot pad. Um, and, and remember, this is in the context of a front foot pad. Uh, so obviously it's not accessible for everyone to do if they're not willing to make a, a sensor swap or foot pad modification to an existing foot pad. So I don't expect it to necessarily apply to everyone. And, and the main reason that I do not like the air pad is because of its material. The material is much softer. It's about half as soft or half as firm, sorry, as the cush material. And what that translates to, and the way I notice it, especially being as a heavier person, is that when we ride, we put more of our weight on our front foot. And that's just to, you know, cause the nose of the board to dip down further and, you know, to change that center of gravity and where, how, where and how we apply um, the weight to engage the board to make it move forward or back. And because you're putting more weight onto the front foot pad, you notice it more than on the rear and that's this material difference and, and the way that manifests itself to me is my foot would go numb it would go a little sleepy and then basically my foot would cramp up uh and and that happened surprisingly quickly uh because it happened so quickly is really the reason why i can't recommend it and it would happen within about a mile my foot would start going numb whereas I can ride with the Kush High like five miles, you know, be before I even notice like my foot starting to cramp and that's with how minimal I'm riding. Um, and I've never had that problem with the Kush. So I can't really recommend the air pad. There's unique things about it being, you know, the metal frame that they have in here, this lip and the only, and, and, and the embossed, you know, logo that they have here. So, you know, the embossed logo is a detractor for me. It's a con. It's annoying. It's kind of anti-competitive in a way to say that, like, you can't use other people's grip tape without cutting out for this or making a modification to the foot pad. I really don't like it. It's an unneeded step. Um, this lip is, it works for what it is. And, but I mean, I don't think it's very necessary. It's not a selling point to me. Um, the frame though, the, the, the metal frame in here that they've got, it is nice in that it keeps it like flat down on the rails and it doesn't bulge or anything. But that, that's not like necessarily a huge selling point to me either. What's more important is how does it ride? Uh, and, and for me, it does not work well as a front foot pad. Um, then, so when we get into the cushions, th there's really nothing wrong with them. It's just a matter of finding the one that suits you best. You know, if you're not looking for a ton of concave, the low works fine. Not a lot of concave there. Uh, relatively flat. The high is probably my overall choice. You know, if you're to buy one foot pad, you can't go wrong front or rear, you know, unless you have, you know, huge feet. Uh, in which case it may work better in the rear. For the front, I think that the, you know, comparing the wide versus the high, 
the wide is gonna or the wide works better as a rear because we're not as sensitive in terms of foot placement. Um, I don't find that I look for the edge of the rail to index my rear foot where I do on my front. So if you do use if you don't use the rail to index your front foot and you maybe want to overhang more on the rail side, you know, the wide could work better for you. Um, but I, I, I don't see that there's necessarily a need for the wide over the high in most cases. And the only case I really see that is if you have larger feet. Um, and I, I honestly think that, you know, the best approach in terms of which foot pad you use is going to be really more dictated by kind of like aesthetics and having that symmetry front and rear. If you use a high in the rear, you use a high in the front. But if you use a wide in the rear, there's no problem, you know, really using a high in the front either. I personally have my board set up with a high in the front with a wide in the rear. Um, and, and that's just preference. I mean, I can go and use a high in the rear as well. It makes no difference to me. It's just what I have on the board right now. And I can't be, you know, really bothered to make that change. Um, so the GT foot pad and ghosting, it's kind of a sensitive subject. Um, I'm not going to get into the politics of FM and the GT's launch, more just speaking on the foot pad and sensor implementation and why I think it's the foot pad that's causing a lot of the issues uh, in, in terms of ghosting. Um, I am aware that there's some thought out there as well that believes that it could be former related and or hardware related outside of the foot pad, and that's being like the gyroscope or IMU. Um, and where that kind of plays in is that if it's one of those items, what happens is like if you turn the board upside down and it's running, it should stop. Or if you lift the nose up and it's running, it should stop. And in those cases, it's the board necessarily isn't doing that. So with those kind of as checks, that kind of leads to more of a, it's not a foot pad issue, but we still kind of come into how do we end up at those symptoms, those items happening. And the first part of it is there's some kind of foot pad issue. So within the foot pad issue, uh, to start, I just kind of want to make sure everyone gets an idea of what does the sensor look like underneath the grip tape. So this came from Jeff. Uh, TFL I posted on Reddit and we can see that there's basically one giant layer of Velostat which is the black material and then where we see the silver dots that's essentially the connective trace material um, it's think think of it as fancy aluminum foil that's printed as like a circuit board yeah I guess that's the easiest way I can explain it um, so basically you have a giant circuit board that's there separated into a left half and a right half. And then they use the Velostat, which is a black, more or less basically plastic conducting material, um, to close the circuit. And that's what says, you know, this side is on, that side is on. Um, and then, so what we see here and where this noticeably differs, you know, I kind of want to first point out is when we saw the pre-production videos of people with uh, future motion, we saw that the foot pad they had showed vertical line striping uh, from, you know, top of the front of the nose uh, of the foot pad, you know, to, you know, the wheel. And what that suggests is that the Velostat design or the way it was implemented at least was done in strips. Um, it's possible still that, you know, it could have been the same, you know, dot kind of or single piece, you know, ply sheet that was done, but I kind of doubt it. Who knows? Uh, I mean, I, I obviously no one pulled a foot pad apart um, in those videos uh, to show, but I think what they showed us in those videos 
is a different foot pad, a, a different sensor layout. Um, but here, what we can also see to note is that we have these cutouts, okay? And what, what those cutouts are for is to help alleviate the stress and pressure that gets put on the sensor due to the concave. And what we need to know or think back on, uh, you know, this dates back several years, at least probably three, if not more years, the community mindset knowledge thought was, I can't do a front concave. Um, the sensor doesn't work that way. It just can't be done. And the only kind of thing to buck that was you can do it with a V1 sensor. And with the V1 sensor, in comparison of covering the whole foot pad, it was basically just a, you know, five, six inch strip down the middle. That's all the uh, V1 uh, sensor was. And so when we think about that, it was it's done in a relatively flat spot. It doesn't have to compete and contend with this additional second dimensional or second dimension of concave, of flex. And that's where the sensors and the foot pads have been failing in terms of being able to be reliable is when you introduce a second bend, a second curve. Um, and, and that's why the V1s worked is because it was a narrower sensor and it only had to contend with one direction. In a sense, the XR standard foot pad is that same thing. Even though it's wider, the XR foot pad is a curve, it, it is curved up in one direction only. Um, so it, it's not contending with a second bend. And that's why Concave has eluded the community, is that second uh, axis of bend, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and that's what these cuts are for, is it, help, they, it helps alleviate that strain so we can, we can put the sensor on, the, on that surface. It's a combination of, you know, getting it to fit the curvature better and not having... So it's a combination of getting it to fit the curvature of the foot pad better and also for sensor reliability. But my problems with, or, or where I see, um, <clears throat> where I see the issues with the GT foot pad as implemented is that those cuts, those lines, introduce long-term uh, wear spots. And, and I, I say wear spots, and it's probably not the best phrasing, but it's points of weakness. It, it's, where, it's where water and dust, dirt can seep in under the grip tape, under the sensor, and then kind of make, make things uneven, cause bubbles, warping, whatever. Uh, so it could be, you know, then that your sensor doesn't engage consistently, it doesn't disengage, uh, it behaves weirdly when it gets wet, things like that. So from a starting point, I think we have a bad sensor design. And on top of that, with a lot of the ghosting issues already that we see, it's like, if, if you wanted to fix it, and probably the way I would do it if I had a GT and I wanted to make my front foot pad sensor more reliable, one of the options I would look at is swap it out for a pint sensor. You know, just rip the whole thing off, pop a pint foot sensor on, and call it a day. What that would do also is create a smaller sensor area, obviously, but it wouldn't put the sensor up onto a concave surface necessarily. I don't know the exact sizing of a pine sensor, um, but it wouldn't necessarily go up into up into these areas, or if it did, it wouldn't be as dramatic. So it should be more reliable. Then the other option, if I was gonna look at trying to fix it, is I, and I, I really wouldn't recommend doing this, but because, there's a high chance of 
severely damaging the existing sensor that's there. But what it would be, it would be separating the velostat and the the layers of the velostat and the layer where the actual sensor conductive material traces are printed and scratching off or making it so that the th there's no essentially no circuit that comes up into like this top area um and then kind of like in here so i would probably cut off more or less the top third of the foot pad if it's possible and you can't really know if that's possible because i haven't seen anyone separate the velostat from the sen uh from the sensor yet uh and, and that would really depend on because like if it's possible it should work it may it, it's going to be questionable um it, it's going to be questionable as to um you know how doable it is but if you wanted to go out and take a risk a huge risk on it that's the way i would go is i would do it that way i, I would go and try to cut out as much of the sensor that's on the curved concave surfaces as i could or i would swap it with the pine sensor all of that said uh let me go set up for sharing a couple different approaches to how to control a ghosting board is what i'm going to call it um and that's basically for when you realize that your board is ghosting you've done the heel left it hasn't disengaged or you know the board's already exhi exhibited that it's ghosted um so let me go set up for that uh with my board and i can turn it on uh but yeah give me a few minutes all right so my board it's off um and one of the things that we can do to start is if we're out riding and we've done our heel lift or done whatever to remove pressure from one side and it doesn't disengage the easiest way um or at least one of the ways to get the board to stop you know it, it's going to be balancing you out you know the whole time but not disengaging the easiest way is to really kind of roll to the toe side so that your board pops up on the rail um it, it's it shouldn't like so even like right now i've got the my, my tire is making a little bit of contact but when you do it normally what happens is it comes up like so on the rail and if you've got a fender even better because then what happens is the tire doesn't hit the fender or the ground it's on the fender and it doesn't roll away uh so it, it makes it relatively easy to catch it and if anything it kind of just spins around in a circle it works it's not necessarily always pretty um but it's a lot better than the board running off and going who, know, who knows where so i mean at least this way you can get off the board have some control to reach behind you and grab the board as it shouldn't run away as it should you know as long as the ground is relatively flat in the area that you're stopping it should come up on the rail um and you know either either flop all the way over like so and shut off uh assuming that there's no issue with like your imu your gyroscope or the firmware so it should shut off when it hits you know a position like this um but more commonly in the community what's is you know the quick stop you it doesn't necessarily even have to be done at you know speed you can do it at you know a near stop and the one thing i want to really point out with this is <clears throat> we can set ourselves up for you know a little bit more success um mo most people if you don't pay attention you know you may just step on a board like this and right now when i step on the board like this what happens is is I'm putting pressure on the tire, okay? There's pressure on the tire, there's pressure on, you know, your bumper, your float plate, bang bumper, whatever. Um, but what you can do, you know, that, and that's just, you know, with me putting my foot in the normal position as I normally would. But what you can do is one option, maybe, is to move your foot placement to a little bit more on the tail, 
so that this happens when you step onto it, okay? So I put all my body weight on it and my tire pops up. So if I was to do this as part of my stopping, you know, technique format, um, you know, if I did a quick stop in like this, quick stop, came all the way back, then my tire's not on the ground. It can keep spinning if it wants. And, you know, all I have to do, you know, really, is reach down and pick up the board. You know, it should shut off. So I'm not gonna ghost. Now, of course, this could be, you know, a little more difficult if you're at speed, and, you know, you're dragging the tail a little bit and doing it and stop. It, it may not necessarily be um, smooth or easy to do because, you know, just the, the surface of the ground changes. But, you know, what, what, what's important though is, you know, still looking into how can I position my foot in my foot pad so that when I come to a stop, you know, even if, like, this, this is about my normal foot position on my rear foot, you know, how can I get that tire to pop off the ground? So maybe if I just move it about half an inch back, let's see if I can do it. So I can start to do it. You know, maybe it's just leaning a little further back, my, my tire shop starts to pop up. And that may be all that's needed for a lot of people is a small change like that to gain more control over the board. So, I mean, like I can, not, of course, obviously exaggerate it by going all the way to the end and it comes very easy to pop it up like this, okay? So it's just something I want people, you know, to kind of keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to be scared of your board ghosting, okay? Um, there are options and techniques to make it work for you. All right. So uh, that's basically all I have for you guys today. Um, hopefully it helps out a lot of you guys with, you know, GTs obviously, but you know, the way to make this work you know, on how to kind of get control of a ghosting board. Obviously, it doesn't apply to just GTs. You can apply it to a V1, an XR, a Plus. You know, I I even do the same thing um, from time to time on my own board, just because, like, I'm either not sure of, you know, is my foot pad working or is it disengaging or, you know, like, my leg is too tired to do a heel lift. I may, you know, go and do, you know, a quick stop at a really low speed. You don't have to be going five miles an hour. You can do it from a near stop, okay? It's just really a matter of lifting your foot up off the sensor and placing it, you know, behind you or in front of you. I would recommend, you know, that you definitely look at taking the step back instead of stepping forward because when you step back, what happens is um, it leaves the board more or less in front of you and, you know, it makes it much easier to grab a hold of versus stepping forward okay um so i hope like you know you take some of this away uh and it alleviates or helps you know your issues um with ghosting and gives you some things to think about on you know what you may want to do in those kind of scenarios all right thanks